Welcome back. My name's Paul Hopewell and I make all sorts of parts and components in my workshop and I show you how I do it. Today I'm going to show you how I made a batch of Dixon tool holders. Stay tuned because I may use some operations using unusual techniques. I want to say thank you to my subscribers for your continued support and suggest to those who've just found my channel to subscribe. Click on the bell and click thumbs up if you like what you see. Please leave any comments or suggestions. If there's anything you'd like to see, let me know. Originally I was going to buy new tool holders, but then I decided against it because I couldn't guarantee the new ones would be any better than the one that you can see here. So I decided to have a crack at making my own. After all, how difficult could it be? Here's a drawing of the tool holder showing the most important dimensions as taken from the best fitting one that I had. First things first, I had to make a setting fixture so that I could sit the proposed new tool holders at 45 degrees in the various machine jaws. You can see here it's made with stops on the hypotenuse and the adjacent intersection. This is to aid repeatability and sampling. To start with I had some bar ends given to me a little while ago and I decided then that I was going to use this material for making some tool holders. At that time I decided to mill the material all round to pretty near the size of the existing tool holders, but they haven't all yet been cut down to the right length at this time. After milling them all to the right length, plus a couple of thou for final finishing, I got on with the task of roughing out both major slots, starting with the keyway slot first. Then I got on with the tool slot. The tool I'm using at the moment is a 4 flute carbide cutter 16mm diameter. I'm cutting at a depth of about 6mm and a feed rate of about 20mm per minute estimated. The tool speed is running at 400 rpm. I'm finishing the cut to 23.5mm wide and to the full depth of 11mm. The tolerances on this tool holder are for the most part open limit. The only critical dimensions are the 2 by 90 degree grooves either side of the T-nut slot. They are in turn offset by 45 degree to the rest of the holder. That makes the underside of the T-nut recesses that make up the 6mm slot somewhat limited. That is to say if the two grooves are ground too deep or the 6mm slots are too big then the tool holder becomes useless, as the tool post can't grip it. I'm using an 11mm two flute cutter to machine this 16mm wide slot for cutting the uh, tool holder. I'm working at a depth of 7.5mm at a time and I'm working at about 20mm a minute estimated at around 1000 rpm. The only limit that I need to worry about on this side is that the bottom face of the tool slot is true to the outside top and bottom dimensions and in turn true to both of the offset slots on the T-slot side. Yeah, I know that was a bit over the top but you'll see what I mean a bit later. I'm cutting the 6mm deep by 36mm wide slot using a 32 by 5 T-slot cutter. I'm having to do this cut in four passes to get the size I need. I'm running the cutter at about 280 rpm at around 60 millimeters feed. I must admit when I first got started with this cutter I was holding my breath a little bit as it's a Chinese cutter but it coped well. These are all the blocks after having all the straight slots finished. This tilting vise is going to be used to set the two 90 degree V grooves on 45 degree offsets. But first it needs to be set true to the milling table using a DTI. Then it's to be tilted upwards by 45 degrees and with the tool holder mounted in place it will be ready for clocking true to the horizontal and the uh, vertical faces. 
The trick is to fit the cutter to be used in place and secure it. Put the milling machine into neutral so the cutter can be freely rotated and manoeuvre the tool holder using the hand wheels and gently rotating the cutter against the tool holder in both the vertical and horizontal planes. Care is to be taken not to mark the faces any more than is absolutely necessary. Even then you will find it difficult to move the cutter past the work once it's touched it. When you're happy with that, lock the Y slide from moving and using the hand wheel, move the X slide so the tool moves out of the way. Then you can engage the gears again. Now it's time to remove the tool holder from the vise and replace it with the blank ready for cutting. Using this technique saves a lot of time, effort and calculating for something that's going to be finished eventually by grinding. When the first side is finished, I remove the blank, move the cutter back to its starting position, replace the blank back in the vise 180 degrees round, clamp it and then machine that groove although at this time they look a bit like vertical and horizontal faces. Now this is done, I'm able to slide the blank over the quick change tool post and check it for fit. I did this with all 12 pieces and they had a reasonable fit. In fact, certainly better than the two tool holders I already have. But these are by no means finished. Now it's time to put each one into the shaper to machine a 1mm square slot at the bottom of both V grooves. This is the time to dress up all the corners by milling a 1mm by 45 degree chamfer over all edges and corners. That's a lot of chamfering, but it does look better than using a file. This is where I mark out each tool holder for the 8mm tapped holes. I'm using a vernier scribing block against each tool holder to mark the height of each screw line. I also use the scribing block to set the spacing between each tapped hole. I'm cheating with my granite block as you can see here. It's a homemade one using 15mm thick granite tile bonded on top of a 2 inch concrete slab cut to the same size. Nevertheless, it's still very heavy and mounted on three small feet. For the moment, it's as flat as I can get it using diamond paste and another two pieces of granite, working one against the other to get it as flat as possible. Using a punch to indicate permanently where each of the eight mil tapped holes are going to go, I use my drill press to make the five tapping holes in each tool holder. Before tapping each hole, a countersunk tool is used to assist the tapping operation without leaving a burr on the top. Here is all 12 tool holders drilled and tapped to 8mm thread. Now, as you can see, it's time to tidy up all the faces, uh, starting with the top and bottom. Because there's such a small surface area holding onto the magnet, I'm using two reasonable sized chunks of steel to hold this tool holder in place while it's being ground. While doing this back face, and because they are small faces, I turn the coolant on to prevent burning. For coolant, I'm using semi-synthetic grinding coolant, which has to be constantly monitored and aerated when not in use. 
To do this I'm using a fish tank pump and an air brick bubbler running 24-7. Here I'm using a set square on the base of the vise up against the inside of the tool holder then clamping it firmly. This should ensure that the ends are perpendicular to the sides and the top and bottom. But more importantly they will all be the same length. This will help later on. The bottom face of the tool slot is also to be dressed true to the top and bottom surfaces. It's needed to keep the tool square when it is clamped to the quick change tool post. Make sure that the grind wheel got right into the corner, I had to dress the wheel with a sharp corner to reduce the possibility of a radius being ground into the corner. It was a lovely mirror like finish though. After stripping the quick change tool post I mounted it in a vise, protected by some cloth. I used engineer's blue or engineer's micrometer as it is known on the four faces that support the tool holders. Picking up a fresh tool holder I seated it on top of the quick change tool post then took a look at what needed doing. My plan of action was to grind all faces relative to the 45 degree setting tool. Therefore, the grinding wheel had to be dressed back true and square. I decided to grind the two larger faces first until they cleaned up. Then I checked the tool holder against the tool post. It was then the two smaller faces that needed a light cut. And after a quick grind I tested it again against the tool post. This time very little correction work was needed. I was very lucky that the setting fixture remained true throughout and allowed me to put the tool holder back in the vise almost the same place every time. These tool holders will never rock or move about. That's the holders finished, now it's time to get on with the thumb screws. The turning of the thumb screws is really a straightforward lathe job. You can see here I used the centre drill to get it all started. Then I changed it for a drill, um, a tapping drill for an 8mm tap and then tapped it in the uh, in the machine. Since I repaired the tailstock it's been working wonderfully. to tap in the hole, face the end of the material off and then uh, clean down the outside edge to take it down to the outside diameter. See we're machining the spigot for the serrated thumb wheel. using the parting off tool to prepare for parting off first and then for putting a small recess between the thumb wheel and the flange. Thank you. 
I use the lathe file just to deburr and put a slightly exaggerated um, edge on each corner. This is an external knurling uh, device. Um, it doesn't work by th thumb pressure anymore. You have to use a pair of mole grips just to give the uh, adjuster a bit of a tweak. But it still does the same job. Now for the final parting off. See, I'm doing a uh, test fit and it just simply drops on. Lovely. The reason for the shortened thumb screws is that the uh, extended grub screw allowed a nut to be fitted on the top and locked the thumb screw into place when it was set. That's all 12 finished and ready for use. I hope you like what you saw. Please subscribe, click on the bell and click thumbs up. And don't forget to leave any comments, suggestions or if there's anything you'd like to see. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.